Welcome to the Tuesday, June 9th school board meeting. Um, if everyone could join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Okay, Alan, are there any adjustments to the agenda? Uh, we have, uh, will return to executive session to discuss the uh, negotiations that we have, and we'll probably come out of uh, executive session to vote on that. Okay, thank you. Um, could I have a motion to approve the school board minutes for the regular business meeting on Tuesday, May 12th? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Second? Second. Thank you, Mary. All those in favor? I should have asked for comments. Um, could I have a motion to approve the minutes for the special school board meeting on Tuesday, May 26th? So moved. Thank you, Karen. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Peter. Um, any questions or comments or corrections? All those in favor? Thank you. 7 0. Um, comments by our student representatives? Hi, I'm Hannah Deneen, and this is Piper Otterbein. This year, three awards were given out to deserving eighth grade students. Piper Otterbein here won the Maine State Legislature Citizenship Award, and the other awards were given to Francesca Governale and Griffin Carpenter. It recognized them as the 2009 Maine Scholar Leaders for Cape Elizabeth. Also, on the 19th of June, many of the awards will be handed out to middle school students. As a reminder to all students, all library books will need to be returned or paid for before the child is permitted to go to their class each day. And that summer reading lists are going to be on the Cape Elizabeth Middle School website. Also, Mr. Connolly wanted us to mention that we're still collecting box tops at the school, so bring those in. Hello. This year we're ending the year with some fun events. Tomorrow, the 8th graders will be having their 8th grade recognition night. On June 16th, 4th through 8th graders will be attending their step-up day. Also, the middle school will be having their first field day on the 17th of June. June 18th, 5th, 6th, 7th, and 8th graders will be having their beach day at various beaches. And on August 17th, for any new or first-time middle school parents, there will be an orientation at the cafeteria. Are there any questions? Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you very much, thank and you. congratulations for your award paper. Thank yeah. you. I don't think we have any high school students. I do know that we have, I don't know, Jeff, if you want to come up, but I know that we have two new school board student representatives that were elected on Monday, I believe, and that's Julia Springer, who will be a senior, and um, Matt McClavick, who will be a junior. And I will be in touch with them to welcome them onto the board. Um, comments from the public on non-agenda items. Is there anyone here who has a non-agenda item? Okay, seeing none. Um, recognition. Pond Cove's Nature Land. Uh, I asked Tom if he would come up and speak to it. I know you and I were both there the day it was dedicated. It was a, an amazing sight, even in the rain. Mm -hmm. And the kids came out as if there was nothing happening at all that would keep them from coming. It was a great day. Tom. Yeah, I think those of you who were there uh, knew with the spirit of the celebration because that entire project took from 10 to 12 to 15 years. It started way back when, when the Panko playground was just kind of uh, disintegrating a little bit. And people in the community, and not just parents, but uh, town councilors and people came up with a scheme to repair and replace things at Pond Cove in the middle school in Fort Williams. But two people really kept the vision. It was uh, Suzanne McGinn and Lisa Gent, who just kept going with it. Uh, in the meantime, Pond Cove expanded. The kindergarten wing was there, and we preserved that lower, we used to call it the lower playground for nature land. The outdoor classroom is, is just, it's just a treasure. I can't say enough to, uh, for the people who put in all the work and all the craftsmanship to make that happen, including the new weather vane out there. And as I hoped would happen, there's so much pressure on it, even at the end of the year, to use it, that as of tomorrow, we'll have a schedule to use it. And the planning committee, with the help of the climate committee, will, uh, will help make that part of our curriculum in the daily lives of children. So thank you, everybody who did it. It was a tremendous thing to do. 
Thank you, Tom. I, would, I did save your notice, and I think it's, um, it would be appropriate. I'm just going to quickly read the people who, um, and the organizations and the people who contributed to this project. The Cape Elizabeth Land Trust, the Pond Cove Parents Association, the Cape Elizabeth Education Foundation, Portland Trails, Bob Malley and Public Works, Suzanne McGinn and Lisa Gent, which Tom has mentioned, Pat Carroll, Carroll Associates, who also has been in it for the long haul. He was on the original playground committee many years ago. Todd Brightson of Earth Tone Landscapes, General Contractor Tony Owens, Michael Kane, Dana Furtado of DM Furtado and Daughter and his team, Skip Murray and his crew, and Jim Rowe. So thank you to all of those um, people in the community who really made it happen. Um, the music program. The music program, we, we were hoping to uh, honor one of them tonight by being here to perform. Unfortunately, they were not able to do so. But I, I, for one, and I think perhaps some of the board members would like to speak to the fact that the music program is an extremely important part of Cape Elizabeth schools. Uh, if you were around on Memorial Day, you saw our, our middle school band perform and did an amazing job. If you go to the concerts at the high school and the middle school and Pond Cove, you hear some amazing work being done. I think one of the greatest joys of it is to go to a concert at the beginning of the year at Pond Cove and then go to a middle school one and a high school one and see the development of these students uh, through the years to the point where we have middle school and high school kids who receive awards from all over the state for the excellence in the music program. So I think it's important for us to recognize them and recognize what they do for the school system in representing uh, Cape Elizabeth schools. Anyone else want to add any comments? Other than probably echoing your words. <laughs> Um, CIF and the Parent Associations, is that me? Yes. I, um, I think that was, I, I think we put that on there just to recognize CIF. I had a wonderful pasta with purpose dinner several weeks ago, which they featured many of the programs that they, along with the other parents associations, have funded for our schools. And I, this is just a thank you to the parents associations and to CIF for all the terrific support that they provide to our students. And I'll probably just add, I think what struck me most was going through the gym and actually speaking to some of the educators who have received these grants and the incredible enthusiasm and passion um, for what they do. It, it is a pleasure to walk around and see that and sort of, that's, there was so much energy in that room and you, and you realize how that trickles out to all the students. So it was a pretty impressive, impressive night and very well done by the CIF organization. And I would also speak to it from the fact that my wife came. My wife is a principal in South Portland, and she had never seen the list of things that they received, let alone the actual products. And she was just amazed at what happens here in Cape Elizabeth with the support of CIF. And uh, as a matter of fact, has asked me how she could get such a group going in South Portland. I said, I, you'll have to do that on your own. I don't know how to do it. But it is just an amazing amazing opportunity to see what happens for students uh, because of what teachers ask for, for grants and how they carry through. Very, very impressive, to say the least. Um, and the board would, or on behalf of the board, I'd just like to thank, as I'm, and I'm sure my fellow board members would agree, that we just wanted to thank the students who come um, and represent the high school and the middle school and Pond Cove for our principal of the day treat that we had a month or so ago to share with us what's going on in the school. So we appreciate the students that are coming and the parents who facilitate their transportation here. So thank you very much. Um, volunteers, I think we're gonna turn that over to Gail. Good evening. I'd like to give a very brief overview of the program this year. I know you have my annual report in front of you with plenty of details in it. Um, over 925 volunteers have supported our students this year through approximately 20,000 hours of volunteer service. This does not count any of the parent association activities. This is just during the day in school. This is a donation valued at $273,000. How fortunate we are. Due to the economy, there was a decrease in the number of parents volunteering at Pond Cove School during the day. Most volunteer needs were met, though. And um, interestingly enough, grandparents' role in volunteering increased significantly. The community was also generous with tangible donations. More than $14,000 worth of items were donated through media solicitations. How fortunate we are. 
three donated refrigerators, and five TVs replaced non-working items. The middle school received a much-needed and non-budgeted adult-sized wheelchair in excellent condition. Many supportive materials were donated to the life skills programs at all three schools and the choices program at Pond Cove. These materials were not included in their budgets. The number of community members calling to offer unsolicited items increased dramatically this year. I love to hear my phone ring. Um, traditionally, in Cape Elizabeth, high school mentors have provided one-on-one -on -one support for Pond Cove and middle school students, focusing on their social, emotional, and academic needs. This year, for the first time, the largest focus was on academic support. Many of the 37 mentors who met with their mentees 40 minutes once a week provided reinforcement for math and literacy skills. Eight mentors returned for the second year and 11 for the third. Schedules permitted seven mentors to work with the same students for the second or third year. Several of these mentors helped make a smooth transition from fourth grade to fifth grade for some students. And new this year, two mentors were recruited to help eighth grade students transition to the high school in the fall. How fortunate we are. Over 70 community members supported all facets of student learning. Tonight, we're honoring community members who have served 13 years or more. Now, some would say that 13 might be an unlucky number. Uh-uh. We say 13 is an incredibly lucky number. How lucky we are to have so many years of dedicated volunteer service. And I'd now like to ask the volunteers and their supporters to come forward. First of all, we'd like to recognize Betsy Moyer, who's had 17 years of continuous volunteer service, and her supporter is Chris Balsaromira. Good evening. Um, every Thursday morning, Betsy arrives at the Palm Cove Media Center with a cheery hello, rubbing her hands together and ready to shell the five, six, and seven hundreds. Um, for those of you not familiar with that section of the library, it's the animals, pets, and sports, which are the most highly used areas of our library and often the most out of order. Um, getting the books put away and in order really helps the students be able to find what they're looking for and practice the skills that we're trying to teach them. And it's, it's really no small feat to have that happen, um, to have one person be that dedicated to it. Um, along the way, she's also very happy to help a child spell a word on the card catalog or check out a book or tie a shoelace. Um, she first arrived at Ponkov School in 1992 when her daughter Anna entered kindergarten. And after helping out in various classrooms um, there and at the middle school, she settled down to help us out at the Ponkov Media Center. Anna went on to high school and has graduated from college and is now headed for graduate school. But fortunately for us, Betsy has stayed with her weekly commitment to the Palm Cove Media Center. And as I was reflecting on writing something, I, I was thinking about all of the volunteers and what it means to have them there. And what it means is it helps me keep my work focused on teaching. So thank you for helping me to do my job in a more meaningful way. Um, our next rec uh, person to be honored is Ann Waker. Um, she has 14 years of service, and Betsy Nielsen will speak in support of her. Ann Waker has been a dedicated, dependable, and delightful addition to my classroom for 10 years, even though she's been contributing to the system for 14. She's a woman of many talents, and I think I've put them all to the test. In addition to being bright and curious, she can cut and paste, photocopy, put projects up, take them down, create tests, correct tests, research, recycle, label, and laminate, and is able to leave large book bags in a single bound. <laughs> Anne is like having my own personal shopping bot on the web. 
She researches and price checks equipment, software, supplies, and makes calculated recommendations based on reviews and budget constraints. She's an advocate for our students, for me, and for education in general. Erin is clearly generous with her time, but also with her heart. She's always thinking about the students. She tapes shows, buys and donates books to the curriculum, emails me articles she thinks might be relevant to my classes, and is a caring set of eyes in the classroom. After retiring from UNUM several years ago, she facilitated retiree contributions from that company to help endow our technology department scholarship. Her efforts reach far beyond the pile of tasks on my desk, and I would just like to say thanks, Anne, for all that you do for me and for our kids. Our next honoree is Susan McVicker. She has been with us for 14 years. Uh, Margaret Welsh could not be here tonight, and Kathy Walsh is going to speak in her support. Good evening. Um, I appreciate the chance to speak on Margaret's behalf. Uh, Fourteen years ago, Susan McVickers, a retired member of the community, contacted Gail uh, and expressed an interest in volunteering in the school system. In particular, Susan said she wanted the opportunity to help students work on reading and writing. Uh, Gail contacted Margaret, a language arts teacher at the middle school, and Susan has been working with our children ever since. Some weeks, she comes into the classroom every day often returning later to work with the second period. She might have one language arts period in the morning. Susan will, you know, hurry out the door, go home and do errands, and then pop back in for an afternoon class. Some, I know that because she goes by my classroom door. <laughs> um, some weeks later, um, some weeks she'll come in uh, twice during the day to work with different classes. Susan is always eager to listen and discuss with students books they've read and to help them to revise and edit their writing pieces. Susan shares more than just her literary interest and skills with her students. An avid knitter, like myself, uh, she routinely arrives at class a bit early and settles into the back of the room to knit quietly until the children are ready for her help. Over the years, students have marveled at the sweaters and hats and other articles that are always working their way through her needles. Also an avid traveler, Susan always sends a postcard to the class to let them know where she is if she's not available to come in and help them. Susan's affection for the children is reciprocated. Perhaps the best evidence of this is the words from the students themselves. When one class recently made a bookmark for her, they brainstormed the following description to write it on her gift. And tonight when we met in the parking lot, Susan mentioned this bookmark to me. Mrs. McVickers is always happy, has a nice smile, has great patience, is good at writing, has a good sense of humor, helps us a lot, has great patience, I said that, um, gives up her own time to come in for us, really cares about us, never gets grumpy, is very nice and smart, has good concentration when working with us, is very good at editing, is always in a good mood, is like a breath of fresh air. We love how she's so helpful. And I can speak uh, for having known you all these years, not as intimately as Margaret, but we are most grateful to you for Thank the you. amount of time that you've used touching our children. Well, I enjoy them. Thank you. Thanks. I'd now like to call Alan Wishness. He's been with us for 13 years. And again, Kathy Walsh will speak in behalf of Margaret, who can't be here. Hi, Alan. Uh, I don't know if you know, but I did have Emma in fifth grade. Yeah, I do know that. Yeah, and so that was so special. So our lives crossed many, many years ago. Um, Alan first began teaching, excuse me, coaching the middle school debate team 13 years ago when his daughter Emma was a fifth grader. Of course, she was in Margaret's accelerated like jobs class, but we'll let that go. <laughs> she coached the team every, every, he's coached the team every year since. Alan's passion for working with young people was soon recognized by students and teachers alike. Under his tutelage and encouragement, the, student, the middle school debate team has flourished, quickly expanding in size to well over a dozen students each season. From October through February, week after week, year after year, 
Alan faithfully arrived at CEMS every Tuesday at 2.20 for practices, rearranging his own busy schedule to accommodate the teams. When the team traveled to other schools for meets, Alan eagerly rode on the bus with them. Some of us would wonder why, but that's okay. <laughs> Often encourage, offering encouragement and answering their last minute questions on the way. This past season was Alan's last season. Although his leadership, positive energy, and mentorship will be sorely missed, Cape Elizabeth Middle School is grateful for his many years of dedication. The middle school is indebted to him for the wisdom and inspiration that he has given to scores of debate students over these past 13 years. Thank you so very much. We have one more volunteer that cannot be here tonight. Her name is Kathy Fabish. She has been volunteering for 13 years for Joyce Bell in the library at the high school. Um, she actually spent a good amount of her time in the 1990s filing microfiche. She was always very happy to help and surely filed, Joyce says, thousands of thin, flimsy plastic sheets of fiche over the years. Wow. She is an angel. Uh, later, she helped bring order to the magazine, audiovisual, and book collection, and it's in large part because of her help that our students and staff at the high school can locate materials easily and efficiently. Kathy's upbeat, happy disposition is infectious. She is always smiling and eager to learn something new. She also works one day a week for the past three years in the Pond Cove School under the tutelage of Suzanne Hamilton, and she works with students to give them reading support. Um, the students love her. Um, Suzanne writes, to these children, Kathy offers an encouraging, compassionate, and supportive reading friend. What more could we ask for? So thank you very much. We just want to thank all of you on behalf of the school board. We have a certificate of appreciation. Uh, what you do is invaluable. I've actually had the pleasure of working with two of the volunteers, so thank you very much. You made an impact. Thank you very much again. Um, and Alan, moving on to our retirees. Yes. Tonight, the board meeting in June is always an interesting one. Uh, in the process, I'm always taking a look at the new people coming in. But I also look at those people who are leaving. I won't say those old people who are leaving. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> but I would note that we have three people who are retiring this year. And their total years of service to Cape Elizabeth is 70 years. So that's a pretty good record for all of you. So this evening, we would like to take a few minutes to honor each of you. I have a speaker to come up to speak about each of you, and we have a gift for you. But above all, I just want to wish you the best. And I also know I'm watching very carefully eyes, because you know, every time I've spoken to at least a couple of you, the tears start coming the minute I say something. So I'm being very cautious as we move ahead tonight. But what I would do first is ask Tom uh, Eismeyer if he would come up and speak about Ogden Williams, who I might add as he's coming up is not only retiring from teaching, but is in a business that I absolutely love, and that is the sale of books. So there is a piece to that that uh, it interests me greatly. Um, Ogden Williams, Mr. Williams, that's my privilege and pleasure to say a few words about Ogden. Mm -hmm. Ogden's commitment to personalizing the curriculum at Pond Cove has made him an institution throughout Cape Elizabeth. Without realizing it, Ogden almost single-handedly subverted the entire, almost subverted the entire placement process. 
Um, people would say to me or write to me or email me or catch me in the hall and say, I know I can't request a, a specific teacher, but can my child have Mr. Williams? Besides teaching the required curriculum, Ogden has always been on a quest to share its passions. Um, I don't know where to start with examples. I probably shouldn't mention publicly the bread maker, which officially didn't exist in the classroom or the Darth Vader digital voice megaphone to make periodic announcements or requests from his desk, or allowing the kids to throw their homework out the window and then chase around and retrieve it, or asking if it would be, if it'd be okay to ride a scooter down the hall after school if it didn't leave marks and create extra work for the custodian. It didn't, and so he did. And how about the lessons on how to draw dragons? I think his calculus went something like this, for example. Exercise is good for everyone. Running is exercise. I like to run, therefore I will help kids like to run too. So off he went with one of his quests to include running in the school day. After some negotiations with me and reassurance that he would still cover everything in the curriculum, Ogden got permission from all the families and had his classes run, his class run on a regular running schedule. They also ran together in the turkey trot. I bet some of these kids are still running today, some of them on their own and some of them on the track team and cross country team. Here's another chain of logic. Reading is also good for everyone. I like to read. You like to read. Let's keep track of the number of minutes we read. Now, that's not too hard to do, but let's make it more interesting. I'll place little markers at regular intervals along the classroom to track our progress of reading minutes. 1,000, 2,000, 3,000. And then when we run out of room in the classroom to make these markers, I'll keep going down the hall because I'm tall and I'll put little markers near the ceiling, past the library, down the third grade hall, down the stairs, through the lobby. That will give us something to look for as we do our coordinated marching drills, avoiding the lava, if you know what that means, on the way to lunch. These little flags are still tucked in the ceiling tiles at Pond Cove. Um, I don't think most people know what, why they're there anymore, but I hope they stay. Ogden always did things his own way but he collaborated with his colleagues. In some buildings, there's nothing scarier than having seven or eight people come into your room to see you teach a lesson that they've jointly developed. Ogden nevertheless went through, it, through with it, and again, adding a personal touch to the lesson which we had all created. Basically, Ogden has, been, has always been about kids. After a long summer meeting with the third and fourth grade teachers about assessments and formative assessments and rubrics, he mused, wouldn't it be nice to, to spend some time with each kid in the class, just sit with each one and ask them not to perform for a change, just ask them how they felt about school, how they thought they were doing, what goals they'd had for the year. That idea blossomed into a successful SEEP grant application, but Ogden, to this day, claims he had nothing to do with it and, and takes no credit for it, although he did take advantage of the opportunity to do just that. Teacher author Rafe Esquith describes a moment early in his career as a teacher, an elementary teacher, when in his consuming desire to help a student conduct a science experiment, he leaned close to a candle and his hair caught fire. Uh, this naturally caused much alarm and confusion, but he reports a few minutes later all was well and the experiment proceeded. And for the first time in weeks, I felt great about being a teacher. I had been able to ignore the nonsense that all teachers in the front lines face. I had done everything I could to help someone. I thought to myself, if I could care so much about teaching that I didn't even realize my hair was burning, I was moving in the right direction. From that moment, I resolved to always teach like my hair is on fire. <laughs> uh, I know Ogden has, and Peggy have opened a successful business, and, but I urge them to steep, uh, take, keep away from the flame but keep the metaphorical fire burning. And as they say in Writer's Almanac, be well, do good work, and keep in touch. token of our appreciation for all of your efforts. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Thanks. Good luck. Great Roger. words. <laughs> Describe you. you excellent. Thank Good you. luck. Thank, Thank you. you. Appreciate it. <laughs> oh. Is there a microphone? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Gee, well nobody told me I would have the opportunity to speak. 
I could have said wonderful things, could have made a great speech, uh, but um, I'll do what I can. I just have to say that uh, the last year, uh, my years of teaching here have been wonderful. It's like play, really. I've just loved it. I feel uh, basically grateful for the town for paying me what I love to do and grateful to the kids for putting up with me and uh, ditto with the parents. Uh, I find myself a lot of times at home, I'll be sitting and suddenly I just burst out laughing. And my wife will say, well, what, what's, what's that? And it's, all, it's always some little thing. I remember something that happened over the years, some funny kid, some funny kid that did some funny thing. And uh, it's been great. You know, it's just been, uh, it's, be, it's been being like paid to, uh, you know, just do what you love. And I, I just really appreciate the... Uh, opportunity. From the very first time I, I came to Cape Elizabeth, I was applying for a job here, and I just right away understood this is a place that values teachers, values education. I, it, I just felt like this is where I want to be. This is home. It, it, the first, I mean, just, I've loved it. I've loved the parents. I've loved the, uh, the high standards. I've loved the, uh, you know, people take it seriously, and uh, I've been, uh, I'm grateful to have been uh, part of this. So, thank you. Our next presenter is a familiar face who left Cape Elizabeth a few years ago but comes back. Now, stay calm, Julie. <laughs> and he is going to come up tonight to present uh, uh, the award and say some words about Julie Salitas. Buddy. I'm only up to about three minutes standing on one leg, so <laughs> I'm hoping, uh, I know my voice will carry because I still have my, my school voice. All right. Uh, so I hope this is all right. Uh, those who don't know me, my name is Buddy Earl. Uh, I had the privilege of teaching in the middle school for a couple of years um, alongside Julie. And even though I had all those years with Julie, I have to let her know I have three serious questions about her. Um, the first one is, should she be canonized because she's a saint? <laughs> should be, she be idolized because she's this charming, beautiful woman? Or should she be cloned to find someone else who do the good that she's done? And I can honestly say that I don't know of any single teacher that has done as much good for so many kids for such a long time. Teachers sometimes start to grumble when class sizes get 22, 23, and I know there's a, there's a school board regulation. But Julie, her class was the whole school. And I, I tried to figure it out the other day, and I, I think that the average population of the middle school uh, has been somewhere around 500. So if that's true, it means that Julie has touched the hearts and souls of some 15 to 18,000 young people in Cape Elizabeth. Julie's first job all, over all those years was as school nurse. And as such, she had to deal with aches and pains and grumblings, backaches, soreness, stress of being in the middle school. And of course, that was just the teachers. <laughs> <laughs> with, with the students, it went far beyond that. There was scoliosis training, uh, prevention, screening. There were eye and ear checks. There were all the childhood diseases, uh, the upset stomachs, and so on. And I, I recently learned uh, that the first students that, that Julie and I dealt with her, <coughs> 50 years old now. <laughs> and, Last year, I've, I've had a, a couple of occasions to, to be with some of those more mature students. And at least three of the, they're now men, they have children of their own, have admitted that when they were in the eighth grade, they would often fake some illness with their teacher just so they could get down to Julie's office to see the beautiful nurse. Uh, so I thought that was good. Uh, 
Unfortunately, nursing, uh, there are things now that when we started just didn't seem to be there. There are more diabetics now, uh, there's depression, there's anxiety, there are all the, the, the stresses uh, that go with being that age, and, and Julie has always dealt with those. Um, Julie's second job was as an educator, and back in the day, <clears throat> teachers would pair with Julie to teach sex ed, and it, it was very quickly found out that most of us weren't equipped to teach sex ed because we giggled at the wrong time when the kids put questions in the little box that Julie provided. We had no way we were equipped to answer them, but Julie could. And Julie did it in a way that was dignified. She used the right language, the right words. Um, she even, she's now known as, as the teacher with the movie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, sex ed to a fifth grade parent is one of those things that they lose sleep over. So Julie actually has a preview night now where the movie can be seen by any of the parents that are a little bit anxious about just what's going to happen to their kids. And the parents over the years, and I'm, and I'm sure word has spread, have learned to trust her that they're going to make it through it all right. Nothing horrendous is going to be taught. Uh, and Julie does it in a way that the kids come out, the little boys with their curiosity going, oh, wow, I, I didn't know. Um, and that was her second role as educator. Her third role, and maybe the one that was in some ways more, most important, was that of a counselor. And although she was the school nurse, there was a long period of time when the middle school's uh, guidance department was men. And Young ladies do not want to go to men to talk about what is sometimes called the, the three Ds. The change of the body, bullying, and being able to start and retain friendships and relationships. And Julie was a natural. She greeted every student with a smile. Julie could keep secrets. Uh, I think, and Julie, step me if I'm wrong, that, that you were also certified as a, as a guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. So here was a person that not only could deal with the physical problems, but also with those anxieties uh, that happened in those years. Uh, and the same thing was true as, as far as the counselor went with, with we the teachers. Uh, my friend Rick Madden and I actually thought we'd, we'd all uh, retire together, but Julie uh, is, is the, the last one. Um, but I often said that if I ever paid both Rick and Julie the amount of money that I owed them for therapy, <laughs> they could have retired 10 years ago. Um, and I think if you poll the teachers at the middle school, I, I think you'd find that most of them would say the same thing. Uh, my wife taught at the middle school for a while, and she was just saying, Julie always has a smile on her face. She always greeted you in her office, made you feel good. She might have been having a bad day, um, but she went out of her way to make you feel good about who you were and listen to whatever tales you needed to tell. <coughs> so there are three major jobs that, that she was doing for the town of Cape Elizabeth. She's also a loving wife to Stephen. She's the, the proud mom of Annie and Jimmy. And she's also a daughter who, even today, helps her mom get to places that are hard to get to uh, and probably thinks about her every day. So, in my mind, and, and I know in all the, the minds of the people that work with her, uh, Julie is a gem among gems. Um, there's an email going around, probably some of you have gotten it from last week, um, and, and it's some advice from a woman, and, and I, I, I actually read it. And, and after I read it, the, the very first person I thought of was Julie, that these are bits of advice 
that Julie has given many of us over the years. So with your permission, I'm going to get the reading glasses, and I'm going to read just a few of them. And those of you who know Julie will hear her voice in these things. Life is too short to waste time hating anyone. Cry with someone. It's more healing than crying alone. It's never too late to have a happy childhood, but the second one is up to you and no one else. <laughs> Your job won't take care of you when you are sick. Your friends will stay in touch. Take a deep breath. It calms the mind. And the last one is one that, that I've used a lot. In fact, I think right here when, when I retire. And, and I wish I could remember the, the very, very famous person that, that said it. And Julie's heard this before, I know. Children will never, ever remember exactly what we taught them. They will always, always remember how we made them feel. And that's why out there, there are 15,000 or more Kids, adults, grown men and women now who will never ever forget to we will land. So we do. <laughs> Thank you all um, for honoring um, Ogden and Ellen and I tonight. Um, I do want to thank the school board. Um, and I want to take a moment to thank the community of Cape Elizabeth for allowing me to serve as a school nurse for 36 years. It's been an honor and a privilege. What I've come to realize is that the students I had back then now have children who have become middle school, high school, and college students, as Buddy said. They're in their 50s, really. Gussie Barber and Teddy Foden. Only when That's right, that's right. So a whole new generation has come of age. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge one other person. I recall so vividly coming to Cape Elizabeth, my first visit in touring the schools with the then retiring school nurse, Maddie Russ. Maddie is a 95-year-old active member of the Village Crossing community. If you are listening, Maddie, thanks for giving me all of these special memories. I hope I continue to follow in your footsteps. <laughs> Thank you all so very much. And last but far from least, is Ellen Brady. And I want to speak to it for two things. Number one, at Pond Cove for a long time, but also represents the district as the ELL teacher. And so Tom, again, will speak about Ellen. Certainly not least, but also not wearing beige tonight. I'm, actually, I'm really shocked. <laughs> shocked. But John, you came through, I think. Um, when I first met Ellen, uh, she was in the first of the many roles she had done. When I first met her, she was a special educator at Pond Cove. And if you're familiar with special education, and way back in those days, it was almost the same. You know how difficult it is to schedule students from different classes, different grade levels, working around classroom needs, allied arts, lunch, recess, and all the demands that can potentially make even the elementary school day so hectic. But Ellen has always had just the right attitude. Whenever adjustments were needed or new kids came, Ellen, without fail, would say, 
That's all right, I'll make it work. Even when it meant, I would discover later, much to my chagrin, sometimes sacrificing her own lunchtime. Her positive attitude always spread to her students, her lamb's chops, as she still calls them, as she guided them through lessons or encountered them in the halls or helped them on the bus. And at formal meetings, she was, always went out of her way to help families feel not just welcome, but comfortable, supported, and understood as the expert parents are with their own children. Some years ago, uh, as Alan mentioned, the district, recognizing changing needs in our students, added a new position, and to take advantage of, of Ellen's knowledge and experience, she became the officially, officially designated ELL, or English Language Learner Teacher. Without fanfare Ellen, fanfare, Ellen did her homework, consulted with other districts, learned the state requirements, filed all the paperwork, and although she was based at Pond Cove, she had K-12 responsibilities, so now instead of dealing with the ins and outs of one building schedule, she had to mix and match with three entirely different schedules, including starting and ending times. But she did it, and again, with a smile. Though I have to say, she occasionally asked for cab fare on rainy days. Her attitude stayed the same, and I'm sure it was comforting for new students, uh, some of them coming to this country for the first time, to know that Ellen would help guide them through their day. Don't worry, you'll be fine. That attitude is the same in every language. Because she saw only a small number of students in her capacity as the LL teacher, Ellen had the flexibility to devote the rest of her time to help Pond Cove students with math. She did check-ins for their homework and generally helped kids keep organized before they went home at the end of the day. Ellen was a charter member of our then teacher assistance team, which has since become the student support team. And as far as I know, Ellen was the first person in Cape Elizabeth to be called an instructional support teacher. She has always exuded that attitude I mentioned before. Don't worry, you'll be fine. We'll get through it. Ellen's off to re retirement now and spending more time with her grandkids. She'll still make her way around the golf course, remembering very specifically it's the journey, not the number of strokes that count. She even invited me to play around with her recently. When I mentioned uh, that I'm a terrible golfer, she said, yes, I know, that's why I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> so I know they have plenty to do. We're going to miss you terribly, but I know you and John will have a great retirement. <laughs> Thank you all so much. It's been a pleasure to work here. It's been a wonderful experience living here. And um, I've really enjoyed my time with the children. So I appreciate this. And I appreciate you coming. And thank you. I'd like to invite everyone to stay. We have some refreshments. We're going to take a brief break from the business meeting um, to celebrate our retirees. And our volunteers. And our volunteers. And please help yourself to refreshments. TV. Well. I want you to know I brought fruit. <laughs> Just to be on the same side. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I said I'm going to be in trouble if I don't. <laughs> no I don't know you're behind me. Okay. Okay. We'd like to um, resume. Thank you very much, and congratulations again to our retirees. Um, we're going to be moving on to communications, resignations. Alan. Yes. I have two resignations this evening. The first one is from Nicole Ball, who is a second grade teacher at Pond Cove. Uh, in her note, she notes that she, this is formally uh, to notify me that I am resi uh, resigning from my faculty at Pond Cove Elementary School. I will not be returning for the 2009-2010 school year. And I did talk with her today, and the reason she is leaving is because her husband has been assigned to Farmington, and so they are looking at moving up there. And he'll be starting a new job, and she is due in another month, I believe it is, with a new baby. So, so that's where she is at this point in time. Uh, the second one that I have is from Sarah Trull. 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 
Uh, I am writing to let you know that I have decided to resign from my position as instructional support teacher at Pond Cove Elementary School. The effective date of my resignation is June 19, 2009, which will be the last day of school. The past year has been very rewarding to me. I have enjoyed working with the students and staff at Pond Cove and will take many wonderful memories with me. So those are our two resignations. Thank you, Alan. Um, the school board would like to officially congratulate the class of 2009. Graduation is scheduled for this Sunday at 1 p.m., and with any luck, this rain will stop, and it will be held at Fort Williams. Um, the school board um, had a retreat in May. We just, uh, we're, during which or at which we reviewed the progress on our goals, um, which had been set at a meeting in January. We reviewed them for continued relevance and discussed what had been accomplished and what needs continued focus or improvement. Um, we ab agreed that these twice yearly meetings were very valuable and hope to continue those in the future. Um, and sports done right accreditation. Um, Karen or Jeff would like to speak to that. Did you want to make a comment, Alan, on that? Or do you want to? No, I just, I will con congratulate them. Uh, this was, uh, I think, a little earlier than you expected. It was a, a full vote in favor. Uh, what was it, three school systems, I think it said in the notice that was from the newspaper. And so I congratulate all of you who worked on it and the hard work you put into uh, making this possible. Thank you. Um, just wanted to quickly, again, just to announce to our community and to the school board and superintendent how pleased we are to hear this great news. Um, so essentially what we'll, we'll, we will be receiving from the men's main center of sport and coaching um, a written report in about two to three weeks with um, the committee's accommodations and recommendations. Um, once we have that, and then we'll begin sort of the next phase of the Sports Done Right process here in town, which would be really kind of educating um, the community, educating our high school, middle school, Pond Cove, all of our students right through uh, the work that Janet does with the uh, community service as well. So we still have a, some work to do, but um, I think this was a, an important first step in, in um, gaining that, uh, that accreditation piece and, and um, having the materials that we need to, to move forward. So uh, we're, we're excited. There's a lot of, like Alan had mentioned, there's a, a lot of hard work and uh, um, a lot of time involved, and I'd like to just thank our parents and our students that had volunteered their time to um, help with the surveys and help with their input. Uh, I'd also like to thank um, our fellow administrators and school board members that helped with this process as well, um, and Sue and Keith Weatherby who sort of were instrumental in, in uh, getting this program started. So uh, we're really excited to, to get this going and uh, it's really neat. I just wanted to read a quick little um, excerpt from the press release that was um, sent out today. The school department and the community services in both Scarborough and Cape Elizabeth serve as outstanding examples of power of community partnership, said Karen Hawks, director of the Maine Center for Sport and Coaching, which is the headquarters for Sports and Right pro Program. In both communities, the partnership have led to an increased athletic and leadership opportunities for our students of all ages. Furthermore, the partnership has ensured a consistent athletic philosophy throughout the community. So that was just a little excerpt from the uh, press release, and we have be able to hopefully post this on our website and uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And I just want to add to that I really want to thank Jeff Thorke and Janet Hoskin for how they took the lead in pulling everything together and, and making sure we followed through with the accreditation mm -hmm. process and Jim Stevenson from Sports Done Right who worked with us and the whole Sports Done Right leadership team which, which was comprised of parents and students and other community members who have been working on this over the past two years. And I think I mentioned their names last time, but that visit, the visitation day when Sports Done Right came and we spent the whole morning with them, it was pretty extraordinary to have the administrators be part of things, um, a, a lot of students become part of the conversation. We learned a lot, and I would say that the accreditation board, they were very impressed and very appreciative, and we had some really um, worthwhile and healthy conversations about you know, what we've done. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of positive that we're already doing and um, where we're headed, and it just provides us with a wonderful opportunity, wonderful resources to really move, I think, in a, in a, in a great direction. So I cannot thank everybody enough, but especially Jeff and, and Janet, thank you, because it, 
the baton has been passed, and I can see how you all are already incorporating some of um, the good stuff that comes from this embracing this type of philosophy, which we've been embracing over the years, but it's just going to make it that much stronger. So thank you. Any other comments? Thank you very much again for the sports done right, work on the sports done right. Um, Turning to new business, consideration of the superintendent's nomination of new teachers for 2009-10. Alan? I, first of all, I'd like to thank the administrators who have worked so hard to uh, interview uh, these people, to get people in place. We still have some more to do, uh, and we will be continuing during the first part of the summer. But I would present the following people to you uh, as candidates. And the first one is James Seeger. Uh, you have a summary of his uh, resume in your packet. Uh, showing that he has been at Brunswick School Department teaching English. He also was at Portland Public Schools in Waterboro and taught in New York City. James will come here for one year to take the place of Karen Lamb, who will be on maternity leave. Uh, uh, did I say that right? Karen Lamb. Yeah. Yeah. Karen Lamb at the high school. I hesitated there for a minute when you said who. I thought I may have said the wrong name. So the, he is a one year position. Do you want to do these one at a time? I was just wondering, I probably we should probably do that. Do that. Yeah. Okay. Um, could I have a motion to accept um, the superintendent's nomination for James Seeger? Seeger for the year 2009-10? Siegel. 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 I, I thought so. Okay. Thank you. So moved. Thank you, Linda. Second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? So this will be a high school English position. High school English position, yes, for Thank one you. year. Anyone else? Um, in times past when we've had um, <clears throat> candidates before us to approve, typically isn't there a summary of the, the committee that interviewed and the reasons why the person was chosen? I did not I bring that. I do have that if you'd like to see them, but I do have those back in the office. Yeah, that's typically what we get as a board in our packet, and I, 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 it won't hold me up in voting, but I would like to try sure. to remain consistent in our procedures. Okay, all those in favor of the motion on the table? Seven, nothing, thank you. Okay, next. The second candidate we have is Joni Hewitt, who is a uh, candidate, uh, excuse me, it lives in Cape Elizabeth. Joni. Uh, is finishing up one year of teaching in kindergarten at Brown School in South Portland. It was a one-year position and was not renewable. Uh, she has been an EdTech 3 ELL and math support at Pond Cove a uh, year before last. She's also been a substitute teacher, early kindergarten teacher at the Discover Center, owner and teaching uh, director at Ledgemere Country Day School, uh, founder and teaching director at Seaview School and Montessori teacher at uh, Breakwater School, and she will be coming on to be our ELL teacher to take Ellen's place. And that will be K through 12. It's a district position. I move that we approve the superintendent's recommendation for the hiring of Joni Hewitt for the ELL position. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Kathy. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven, nothing. Okay. The third candidate is uh, Cynthia Tardiff. If you look to the next page, you will see her resume. Uh, Cynthia is currently at Fountain Academy. She will be coming in as the middle school uh, nurse. Uh, if you look down through her uh, resume, you will see she was also at Seal Rock Healthcare in Saco, uh, at uh, the correctional medical, doing correctional medical services at Cumberland County Jail. Uh, she has background at the Franciscan Hospital in Boston. Also, friend, uh, also at the Protestant Guild in Waltham, Mass., Fitchburg Schools, and Wellstar Health System in Marietta, Georgia. And she uh, came up here from Marietta to work in uh, Point Academy. Is there a motion to accept the superintendent's nomination for this nursing position? So moved. Thank you, Karen. Second. Thank you, Linda. Questions, comments? It, is she, am I reading this correctly? She's got three positions that she's currently working three jobs? Yep. Is she, she, she is, she's dynamite. One's a summer job. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Any other questions? All those in favor? Seven nothing, thank you. The next one is David Croft. David Croft has been in the system. He had been an attack. 
Uh, this past year, he did step in uh, for Morgan Br Burns. Uh, he has done such an exceptional job. When the position opened up, he was interviewed and has been hired for the position uh, as at uh, Pong Cove. Am I correct? And uh, so his nomination is now as a teacher at Pong Cove. Mm -hmm. Teaching what position? This will be life skills at Pong Cove. Is there a motion to accept this superintendent's nomination? David Croft? So moved. Thank you, Karen. Second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven nothing. The next one is Su Susan Pillsbury. Susan Pillsbury has also been an ed tech in the system. And again, because of the work she's done, she was interviewed for a teaching position. And this position is as? At Pond Cove. And so Susan will be replacing her as a teacher. And as you can see, she also has background uh, in several different areas uh, in, uh, since 1986. Is there a motion to accept the superintendent's nomination? So moved. Thank you, Mary. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven nothing. Okay, moving on to... The I have one more oh, sorry. that uh, yeah. came in. I, I could have held it for later on, but since it was done, I thought I would get it out of the way tonight. And that is for Heather Jones Kennedy, who will be coming in as the halftime health teacher at Pond Cove. If you'll remember correctly, our health teacher left partway through the year this last year. We hired an interim to finish up this year. Tom has done interviews, uh, and Heather is the, was the choice as the teacher. As you can see, she holds a master's in education degree in health, education and community health planning from Penn State University. Uh, she is certified in health and physical education, and her background has been high school and middle school assistant teacher at Cumberland, research assistant, uh, health educator, and head volleyball coach in Westfield, New Jersey, and director of aquatics, aquatics in Westfield, New Jersey. And again, I did not put on the, re the references as far as the discussion. I had forgotten that those should be on there. Is there a motion to accept this superintendent's nomination? So moved. Thank you, Linda. Second, Mary. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven, nothing. Okay, now to co-curricular. <laughs> okay. I, you have a few of these, and they're by section, so we'll, we'll approve them as a slate for... Um, for example, Pond Cove co-curricular so as a slate. Each one. Okay. So the first one is from Tom Eismeyer. This is a recommendation for Pond Cove co-curricular positions. Mm -hmm. As I go down through the list, the first one is Linda Paul, K team leader. Julie Nickerson, grade one team leader. Lynn Spadinger, who is grade two team leader. Mary Dulac, who is grade three team leader. Tara Bucci, who is grade four team leader. Tara is also, as you see, is new. At this. She's been there. But she is uh, taking this position on for someone else. And as you'll see on the right-hand side mm -hmm. is a brief summary of her work at Pond Cove. And then you have Angela Moore, who is the IS team leader. She's also new, and it also talks about Angela regularly facilitating the weekly IS team meetings. Uh, on the back of this, uh, you have Judy Ferranti, who will be the allied arts team leader, Karen Abbott, teacher support team, Cameron uh, Rosenblum, student support team, Angela Moore, student support team. Debbie Butterworth, student support team. Cindy Perkins, the same. Becky Swift, the same. And we'll share that with Deb Jordan Pearson and Suzanne Hamilton. And my recollection is these are fewer support, uh, support team members than we had in the past. Three, three less. Is there a motion to um, approve these co-curricular fee position nominations? So moved. Thank you, Karen. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Peter, are you approved? Opposed. opposed. Okay. Six um, in favor, one opposed. Okay. Um, I would note also that Tom did add to this the team leader rules, uh, 
roles and responsibilities is a, a section with that. The second group is from Cape Elizabeth Middle School recommendations for extracurricular positions. First one is Chorus 5-6 is Becky Bean. Uh, Chorus 7-8 is Becky Bean. She is returning to the same position she had this last year. Drama is Steve Price and Evan Solander and to be announced and it is divided according to what they are doing. Uh, instructional music for 5-8 through eight is Terry White. Math Team 5 through 6, no one has been selected at this point. Math Team 7 through 8 is Brian Forcaro. Uh, speech is Elizabeth Johnston. Debate uh, replaces the newspaper stipend, and that is Jennifer Cox. Student Council is Carrie Newton and Chris Drake sharing that position. And on the back, you have the talent show with Steve Price and Evan Solander. Yearbook to be announced. Team leader, grade 5, is Matt Whaley. Team leader, grade 6, is Charlie Carroll. Team leader grade seven is Deb Casey. Team leader grade eight is Chris Monez. Uh, team leader, uh, uh, so yes, thank you. Uh, it's uh, Marguerite Lawler. Allied Arts. Allied Arts. Marguerite Lawler Rohner. Uh, team leader for world language is Lisa Leonard. Team leader for the IST team is Cheryl Joyce. SST grade five is Sally Conley. Grade six is Marguerite Lawler Rohner. Grade seven is Carrie Newton. Grade eight is Brian Forcaro. And SST coordinators are Kim Sturgeon and Gretchen Earl sharing the position. I move that we approve the um, extracurricular positions for actually co curricular positions and extra wait, and extracurricular positions for the middle school as presented by the superintendent. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? Question. Um, the debate position shows as a new position. I don't understand what it means to replace his newspaper stipend. Steve, would you speak to the question about, the, about Jennifer Cox and debate and why it notes it replaces the newspaper stipend? So it's not new. Oh, because he was a volunteer. That's why. Um, first off, as we heard tonight with the volunteers through Gail Schmader, Alan Leishness has been volunteering as the speech coach. He's worked. Margaret, Margaret Welch has done the debate, and that was a stipend position. And then Alan was um, gratis. So um, in order to have a speech and debate team next year, I need to provide a second stipend. Um, Carrie Newton did the school newspaper this year. Adam Killip did it previously. Both people have really struggled to get kids to, because frankly, there's just too many things going on at school. Kids are too, almost all involved in sports and, and band and whatever else you have. And so there hasn't been, it's been very difficult to maintain even four or five students to move along. And the other piece, uh, the reason why we're figuring, okay, we won't worry trying to inject the energy into that um, is because we have, uh, Dean Zaharis has constructed a site for next year where, where teachers will be able to add exemplary um, student response pieces. So we feel that we'll cover the bill about sharing writing. So this is a new position? It's not a new position. It, it, was, I, it, it's, it was a volunteer it, position. It was previously, uh, several years ago, it was a paid position. Then Alan came in and and it was not a paid position, and now I'm turning it back over to a paid position. So, so it's the position has always existed? Yes. But this is but new to our budget? Yes. Thank you. But it's not incremental because he's switching from the newspaper. He's taking the funds that we've traditionally, the stipend we've traditionally paid for the newspaper is being eliminated per se and transferred for, to debate. So it's not an, the total number of extracurricular positions at the middle school has not changed. There's it's no the same number. Funding. There's no additional funding mm -hmm. requested. So there isn't just a shift. Okay, right. Thank, Thank you. Yep. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you, Steve. You. Um, all those in favor? All those opposed? Okay, six to one. Um, I think we have one more co-curricular before we move to the athletics. The last one is from Gary Lenoy. This is Wendy Derzewick who is the webmaster, and we pay her sixteen eighty seven fifty for the school side of her work in the town. She also receives money from the town as well. I move that we approve the um, 
Superintendent's recommendation for Wendy Dershowitz as our webmaster. Second. Thank you, Mary. Any questions or comments? Question. Um, there's no number of hours or rate. Did you know how that, let's see, Gary, how that works in terms of is it designed for a typical number of hours at a certain rate, or is this a straight rate? Pauline, Pauline is. There is a number of hours. It's just not listed here. It is at the same rate as the other one, but an hour rate. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All those in favor? 7 0. Okay, athletic fee positions for the fall. Okay. First ones I have are from uh, the middle school. Uh, first one is Ben Dyer, who will be eighth grade boys soccer. Uh, Wayne Wing, who will be eighth grade girls soccer. Diane Nicholson, who will be eighth grade field hockey. Christopher Drake, who will be seventh and eighth grade tennis. And Megan Greenlaw, who will be a seventh grade girls soccer. Uh, on the next page, you also have Mark Ash, who will be 7th grade boys soccer, Joe Doan, 7th and 8th grade cross country boys, and Brian Hansen, 7th and 8th grade tennis assistant. Is there a motion to approve this slate for athletic positions? So moved. Thank you, Kathy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? All opposed? Six to one. Okay, high school. Uh, high school, <clears throat> I have Gary Newell, who will be the girls' varsity soccer coach. Uh, Don Burke, who will be the girls' JV soccer. Andy Strout, girls' assistant soccer coach. Ben Raymond, boys' varsity soccer. David Croft, boys' JV soccer. Charlie Carroll, boys assistant soccer coach. Marianne Doss, girls cross country. David Weatherby, boys cross country. Uh, Darcy Holland, varsity girls field hockey. Uh, Leslie Young, JV girls hockey. Uh, Aaron Filio, varsity football. Ron Kirstead, football assistant. Ryan Piper, football assistant. Tom Wiley, football assistant. Art Jones, football assistant. Uh, you will Notice that Tom Wiley is a volunteer and Art Jones is a booster. Uh, Ryan Piper, I see school R booster. That's a, that's a booster. It should be a booster position. So that $3,159 comes from the boosters. Okay. Uh, Chris, M Chris Mims, who is football assistant. Uh, Darren Davis, who is football assistant. Uh, they are both booster. Uh, Bill Hogan, who is football assistant, a volunteer. William McGarry, golf co uh, coach. Uh, Nicholas Sanson, who is um, golf co, uh, co coach. Uh, Rob Thompson, girls volleyball. Aaron Spaulding, JV boys basketball. Oh, that's the end of it. Is there a motion to approve the superintendent's nominations for these positions? So moved. Thank you, Karen. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Any questions or comments? Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to pick on you, Jeff. How many people does it take to run a football um, department? Jeff, if you could go to the mic up there, please. I mean, I'm looking at one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Football assistants. Yep, that's it. That you know, I think in a in a sport where it is um, very specific in the different types of roles, um, they have different. They have running back coaches, tailback coaches, um, uh, secondary. They have, and also they have people that are um, watching game film. And so it, it's a pretty technical, it's very different from any of the other sports that we run. The school portion of this um, supports, the school budget supports our two. head coach and a two varsity assistants. Or essentially our, one of the varsity assistants is a JV coach as well. So the school budget supports three coaches for football? Actually, it looks like it's only two. Varsity football and football assistant. The rest are boosters. Oh, I'm sorry. Volunteers. Yep. I didn't cross out Ryan Piper. 
Ryan Piper, that's a booster, and uh, as Alan had mentioned, that is booster funded. So Aaron Filio and Ron said are booster, uh, I'm sorry, school board supported. And um, how many okay. students approximately play football? We have a little over 50, between 50 and 55. Um, same question for golf. We have two co-coaches. How many students are playing golf? Golf, we have a limited number on the, on the um, course. And that, that, that position, uh, we have 15 that are allowed to use for Pudic. Um, but that position is, um, that stipend is split in half. OK, so normally you would have one. It, that would normally one. be one coach coaching the golf team. Mm -hmm. I've lost the number of hours here. Number of hours, 105, 60, so 210, 11 hours. Yeah. Which is pretty consistent with. Okay. Um, and girls. cross country, for instance, cross country runs on the same schedule as as golf, as far yeah. as their girls regulars. volleyball. Yep. It says Girl, new position. Girls volleyball this year is a new position. Um, not a new hire. The um, school budget did not support that position in o, this school year, 08, 09. Um, 09, 10, it is budgeted into the school budget. Because I remember when we approved it as a club mm -hmm. sport, and I believe at the time, I could be wrong, I'll look to the rest of the board, I believe at the time we indicated we would not support it financially. I thought that was the Title IX issue. Yeah, that, that was, that was, sport, that was girls ice issue. hockey and the volleyball position were Title IX issues, and we talked. We during the uh, I think this had occurred during the budget process. Yeah, we discussed this. So you're right. We did approve it that way, but I think then the Title IX issues surfaced. So we had two girls sports. We were down two girls sports. We were. So we are now at 13 and thir 13, 13 girls 13. programs, 13 boys programs. So there's a phase-in program for girls ice hockey. And Does that phase-in also include um, financial support versus club sport? There, it, there is a financial um, an equity piece, especially looking at uh, ice hockey is an easy one to compare because when there's a boys program, a girls program, there needs to be a plan in place to um, have those both equitable. Um, the girls volleyball position, we have sort of um, use the same model that we're using for ice hockey, um, obviously without the added ice expense. Okay. Thank you very much yeah. for all, answering all my questions. Sure. Any other questions, Rebecca? And then, oh. just for clarification too, the JV boys basketball, that's, in, that's for the next school year, 09-10. J, that would be for the Aaron Spaulding. Winter for the season. winter season. Coming up, yeah. yeah. Um, mm -hmm. The current coach had stepped down to go continue with his law school um, degree, and Aaron was working with our um, assistant coaches with the girls' varsity basketball program, and he has now taken over his JV basketball for next winter. Rebecca, did you have a question? Yes. Um, so how long have we had seven football assistants? We probably had... I'd say I think six last last uh, school last fall, this 08, 09 fall. And how many before that? The year before that? Uh, that's information I. You don't know. I just don't have that. Since Aaron Filio is the appointed head coach, we've had at least six, if not seven. Yeah. Previous to that, we had two. Okay. Any other questions or comments? I think we have a motion on the table. All those in favor of um, s uh, approving the superintendent's nomination for these athletic fee positions? Um, all those in favor? Five. All those opposed? Two. Okay, I think that's everything for our co-curricular. Yes. Um, consideration to grant the superintendent authority to hire over the summer. I think this is a standard thing that we've done every year. Um, is there a motion to do so? So moved. Thank you, Kathy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Peter. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? 
7-0. Um, Rebecca, policies for second reading. Okay. Um, I think I'll take this one at a time. Yes. First policy that's up for approval is policy JICH, substance abuse policy. Um, nothing has changed since we met to, uh, for our first reading, but I will briefly summarize what those changes are to the policy. Um, on page three under section eight, um, it's now titled Disseminating Information About This Policy, Collecting Signed Acknowledgements of Understanding. This is basically where we're addressing the issue of the perception that parents and students have been signing what they thought was a contract, when in fact what the intent was is to have parents and students acknowledge that they've read the policy and the, uh, or elements of the policy and understand it. The next um, substantial change is on page five. Um, section B, it's the um, suspension from covered activities. It's first offense within a, uh, with self-reporting. And previously it involved, uh, the consequences involved um, not being able to participate in um, the uh, activity for a period of time. Um, now uh, the committee and I believe the school board will be wanting to allow it to become more of an educational consequence to encourage students to come forward um, and have a chance to meet with our counselors, um, our social workers, and, and to perhaps avoid future issues. So I move that we approve policy JICH as it's presented this evening. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Any questions or comments? Kathy? Um, I would like to know from Alan and or Jeff Shedd if they have any concerns, further thoughts about this policy, things, I know we've, it's been gone over a lot. I know that there's been some issues, especially in the past couple days, and if they had anything that they would suggest be added, subtracted. Um, I, I'd feel better if I knew that they were very comfortable with the policy that we have. And Jeff, I would turn to you, because obviously you're the one who is dealing with it at the school, and therefore, any information I have is through our discussions and review of what's going on. Um, I, I guess I would say that, number one, I, I think that the changes that the board is considering making tonight make sense to me. Um, I think the most, I think at a number of levels, um, bringing down the explanation of what the policy means to a lower level than a mass meeting in August as uh, students and often parents' first introduction to the high school, I think is a, is, a, is a good change. I think that changing the, the consequence for a first offense self-referral, the hope is that it will encourage a little more sort of honest communication with the school and among parents within the community and kids within the community. Um, because we certainly know that many violations take place that never come to us and they do create a dynamic of sort of um, tension, I think, between community members. Um, the, the big philosophical issue that this particular um, proposal doesn't suggest changing at this point, but I think it merits some consideration down the line is is whether or not the community wants to have the school involved philosophically in issues that take place outside outside school grounds and unconnected to school events to begin with. Um, and then I think connected to that, in my mind anyway, I think there is sort of a resource question uh, about if that I think we're gonna have to have some conversation about, um, and I've talked to Alan a little bit about it with the next budget year is, to the extent the school withdraws or has a conversation about withdrawing to a strictly educational role, do we have the resources that we need in order to do that resource, that educational role effectively? Mm -hmm. um, and I think, I think at this point, I can't say to folks that we really do. Um, I will also say just in terms of why um, there is a role that 
virtually every school, not every school, but most schools that I'm familiar with anyway, take a role in overseeing activities uh, that take place off school grounds to the extent students are participating in, in activities which are privileges. Um, it is not because the school desires to supplant or uh, parental roles. That's not the issue at all. Um, but it is a reaction, I think, to the very real, the way I express it at the August meetings is that we are at best a junior partner to parents in doing what parents and the community wish us to do. Um, it's not a role that we actively seek out because there's any distrust at any level of parents, but very often what happens when there are things that take place in the community that deal with substance abuse that cost people injuries or even worse, very often people look to the school um, to try to figure out what is the message that the school has sent um, and is it, a, is it the message that needs to be sent. So schools sort of get brought into the whole um, situation around some in limited involvement and in my mind a junior partner involvement in sort of reinforcing the values that the community tries tries to reinforce so that's a long-winded answer I, I, I do I think that these changes leave the policy a perfect policy no I don't think necessarily I'm not sure that there is a perfect policy having talked to many principals um, the issues that we face in Cape Elizabeth are no different qualitatively than what other communities face in terms of compliance with these policies and, and it's, it, is, it is a very common struggle and you know, we will make this change now and three years from now something else may, may some other issue may come up and we may have to try something else. I, it, it's, a, it's a very well intentioned and for some kids a meaningful deterrent and a meaningful excuse for some kids to say no. It is far from perfect, um, and it creates some problems on its own, which I think some of these changes are intended to try to resolve. Thank you very much, You're I welcome. appreciate it. Any other questions? Um, I think there's a motion on the table. All those in favor of um, the motion, or, or yeah. pol approving the policy as presented. Seven, nothing. Okay. The next policy is JLCA, physical examination of Cape Elizabeth students. There were no um, comments from the public or um, school board members, so I move to approve JLCA as it is um, for the board. Second. Thank you, Rebecca. And Kathy, any questions or comments? All those in favor? Seven, nothing. Um, and then policy JLDBG, reintegration of students from juvenile correctional facilities. Again, there were no comments from the public nor additional thoughts from the school board so members, so I move that we approve this policy. Second. Thank you, Mary. <coughs> Excuse me, any questions or comments? Is the note piece coming out of it, Rebecca? Um, I don't believe so. I believe that the note is part it needs to be here for legal reference. Okay. Any other questions? All those in favor? 7-0. Thank you, Rebecca. Uh, first readings. Okay. We have three policies for the first reading. Um, and again, for those who may not be familiar, first reading just means that it's coming before the board and the public to notify um, that there are being changes recommended or that it has been reviewed and um, being recommended for reapproval. The first one is JFABD, which used to be JLG, just for those of you who follow policy acronyms. Um, admission of homeless students. Um, we are basically following the recommended, uh, oh, I apologize, I believe it's the MSMA form. Um, right. And I, Dominic has reviewed this and has said that it meets our needs. The second one is KBF, Parent Involvement in Title I. Again, Dominic has reviewed it and believes it's fine, although I just saw something that we did not take care of. So on page two of three, we are supposed to be inserting a Dominic. That's um, what first readings are for. Exactly. Back to this. 
we, uh, we need to insert a number in, uh, to the, a re in addition to the required annual meeting, at least a certain number of other meetings shall be held at various times. So we will get that taken care of um, at our next policy committee meeting. And then finally, KLF statement of community education. This is a um, policy that uh, Janet had worked on and presented to the policy committee. Um, and the changes are underlined. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything in particular that should stand out except the fact that we're trying to add to it um, recreation because it's an acknowledgement that it's not just education and community services, but recreation. Um, and there is a paragraph C that does say that the community services department and personnel shall be considered a division of the school department and therefore will follow school board policies and procedures that are applicable. Again, this is just a first reading. If I encourage uh, school board members and the public to um, either share by email any concerns or thoughts or to come to our next meeting, which I believe is going to be in September. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, the next two items um, we have moved and adjusted for an executive session. Um, next item, consideration to approve text we can fundraising efforts. Alan, Rebecca, I'm not uh, sure. Okay. Um, Right. There we have a, the school board has a policy that requires it to approve any um, fundraising that is related to the schools in the amounts of over $20,000. There is a private initiative called Text We Can that is attempting to raise $60,000 to facilitate the, um, let's call it jump starting of the middle school textbook replacement cycle. Um, and so I would move that we approve the um, efforts of Text We Can and its fundraising efforts. Thank you, Rebecca. Is there a second? I'll second. Thank you, Mary. Questions or comments? Rebecca, you know, since we don't have anything in our packet to talk about this and we're on camera, can you just say a little bit more about who Text We Can is and what their, mm -hmm. what their I don't know what you want to call it, mission statement, mm -hmm. goal, that kind of thing. Yes, and I apologize. I should have brought some of that material with me. Um, again, it's a group of uh, private citizens. Um, I will say that I am um, working with that committee as a citizen but not, and not as a board member. It has been working um, in conjunction with administrators and teachers. Um, its mission is to uh, raise $60,000 that will allow the middle school to get back on track on a regular annual textbook replacement cycle. As it is, it's, the middle school is extremely far behind um, in getting the textbooks up to um, current standards that often our, our surrounding communities have. Um, and also just to get enough textbooks so our, children, our students can actually bring them home and use them as a resource. Um, and I think the goal is to raise that money by, the, by, the, by fall, by the middle or to the end of fall. I don't know if that answers your questions. And um, this is for the middle school. That's correct. And it has the um, principal's approval? Yes. Okay. And the superintendents and the principal's approval, they have been, again, this is just to raise money. The committee is not going to be actually engaged in any of the purchasing of the textbooks. Checks are going to be made out to the middle school. Um, it's just an effort to help. And it's also going to be um, used in partnership with school district money um, that has been put aside this year and next year. So um, it's not just going to be private funds that will be used to help get the middle school back on track. And Linda? I was just going to say, it, is there, so none of the funds are going to go to either one of the, either Pond Cove or high school to help supplement their budgetary cutbacks over the last couple of years to, for replacements on other materials Again, here? this is a private initiative of citizens that heard the distress of the middle school that has been um, discussed year after year. Um, the impression was that while everybody has been suffering, that the middle school in particular has been working from a deficit position um, and that it required a significant effort to get it to be back on track um, and that um, while the high school and Pond Cove probably could use some assistance also, 
that the middle school had a more precarious position. May I, may I speak to it briefly sure. also? Uh, first of all, I want to thank Rebecca and the people who are working on this because it's a very important process. Uh, recognizing the fact that the law says that it's the job of the school system to provide textbooks, you all know, as I do, that over the last few years, because of the limited budget we have had, because of caps and then other pieces, that that has been a constant piece of our budget which has been uh, set aside. And unfortunately, in the, as a result of that, I look at middle school, uh, particularly some of the, uh, many of the subjects having books that are 10, 20, and 30 years old. Uh, we have done better in uh, many cases at Pond Cove in the middle school. Uh, to answer the question about what we're doing, we are first looking at middle school and getting that in place. But we will also, between the money that's being raised and the money that we have in budget both this year and next, we should be able to do a very uh, high quality job in making sure we have those books and there will be some money also for books that we need to look at otherwise. As you know, uh, part of the curriculum instruction and assessment plan has been to look at tax. Uh, but I think it is really important uh, and as superintendent I support uh, without, without question the work that's being done so that between the what is in the budget and what this group is raising, they will make some major steps in the right direction. And so, although normally it would be my job as superintendent with you to raise that money in budget, I have just come to the point where it isn't there. And so we need to work together in order to make that happen. And I don't think, I may be wrong, but I don't think you see this happen in many communities. But it is uh, it's a very important piece to the puzzle. And so, again, I thank Rebecca and that group for all the hard work they've done to raise the money and will continue to raise money uh, to meet a goal uh, to have this happen. Any other questions or comments? Just one comment. Um, I know we don't have a form, and I'm not a fan of forms anyway. But I think we should probably have in writing somewhere um, the group, the, the goal, uh, whatever Rebecca and you know feels should be appropriate with the principal's signature on it, with the superintendent's signature on it, somewhere in the future, the verbal information is going to get lost, and we could then pull up the information, say, oh yeah, that was done back in such and such, and this mm -hmm. is what they did. So that's, I think that's a reasonable request. That's a good idea. Any other questions or comments? All those in favor of um, approving the text, we can have the motion on the table. Seven, nothing. Thank you. Um, consideration to approve the tax exempt lease purchase agreement for computer equipment in the amount of $61,053. I don't think we have to read this entire thing. I was hoping you would say that. Um, is there a motion to approve um, the document that is presented in that amount? So moved. Thank you, Kathy. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Any questions or comments? I think this is Peter. Very similar to the uh, photocopy of contract we had last year. But we're never, as school board members, given a copy of the entire contract. We're never given any information as to whether this was put out for bid to make sure it's a competitive price and a market price. And considering the discussion we had a half hour before our regular meeting, we're now voting on twice that amount of money, and it appears we're going to rubber stamp it with a six to one vote. So I, it just I, makes me uneasy. Yeah. I just want to be sure that I'm understanding the question is uh, that what you would like to see is the actual document as far I as the process goes, I would yep. like to see the yep. document. Yep. And I will mention, this doesn't do that job, yep. but don't forget the second page also where Gary does give a summary of how that money will be spent. Uh, another piece of your, uh, one, another part of your question, though, was whether or not it's, it's sent out to bid. And can yes. Pauline answer that? Is, uh, at yes, I Two banks enough? So if it's going to the banks, this is not really a lease, it, it, it's a loan to pay for the lease purchase of the computers? That's correct. I'd just like to see the board have a more active role in this. We're going to spend $70,000. I'd like to at least know about it before it happens. 
I believe it's a policy matter rather than a daily operations matter. It's within our area of operation. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Um, I think there's a motion on the table. All those in favor of approving um, the motion or the lease? Six. All those opposed? One. Um, consideration to approve job descriptions from the Human Resources Committee. Linda? I move that approval of three new job descriptions from the Human Resources Committee, job descriptions for the school nutrition director, for the EdTech 2 technology integrator for teachers position, and there's also a thank you, developmental kindergarten teacher as submitted. Thank you, Linda. Is there a second? A second. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, any questions or comments? I have a question. Um, sure. I'm sorry, I didn't look to see if I was correct. Yeah, I think I had. Um, on the nutrition director, there is at the top a definition. And I don't see that in the other job description. Don't recall that we had it in prior job descriptions. For consistency purposes, I'm wondering if we need that, if it's also repeated later on in the document, or you know, if it's additional you know what I'm saying mm -hmm. as we work through the process uh, one of the things that we did was take a look at school nutrition directors or food service directors from several different places since we we're looking at a new uh, format for the position we did add the definition uh, you are right it isn't normally in most of them uh, I think we did it mainly to be sure the language was appropriate and accurate as we moved along I know Karen and uh, uh, Pauline had worked with us to try to put this together. I don't know that it absolutely needs to be there, uh, but it, it does help define what we're looking for as a, as a different look to for food services than we had in the past. I don't know. Karen, do you see that differently at all? I mean, I think Kathy raises a point in terms of perhaps that format looking a little bit differently. I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to it. I think it sort of sets um, sets it apart from the others. Yeah, it does mm -hmm. set it apart from the other, yep. but I don't know if there's any harm done, I guess, is it sort of when introduces when, what this job description is all about. See, when I went and read through it, my sense was that the definition is then repeated in different other places, mm -hmm. so it became inconsistent with, like, say, for instance, a superintendent's job position, or, you know, mm -hmm. Another management position, it's in, it was seemed to me that it was inconsistent with principal job descriptions or other job descriptions. And I, I just don't want us to say the same thing <clears throat> in two places or potentially say something different that somebody can hang their hat on. Like, oh, well, my definition, the definition of my job is this, and then not proceed to follow the other pieces. I'm not making real. Clear sense on that. Would it be possible to just take this paragraph and move it underneath performance responsibilities? Well, to Kathy's point, I'm not so sure that it would matter if you even removed it and just went right. straight into the yeah. qualifications because everything is within the content of the rest of it. Right. So that was my thought, but somebody yeah. else might think. I wouldn't have. I wouldn't have a problem with it. My sense is when we put that in, and you and Pauline can correct me, but we were in the process of both doing a job description and deciding how it was going to look in an advertisement. So I think this definition became part of how, what are we really looking for. Mm -hmm. And so I think you're right. I think it can easily be removed. I think it was a part of that bigger discussion. I looked at Pauline. She seems to be saying yes. Okay. And so that, that, can, that can help. Linda, would you? It should be really clear and crisp so that there's no questions. Does that make some sense? Linda, would you like to amend your motion? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> I get the look. Uh -oh. <laughs> oh. I'd like to move that we accept an amended draft as submitted for the school nutrition director, excluding the first paragraph as provided in the document in front of you. How about the first two paragraphs? First two paragraphs as provided in the document. Is there a second? I think who seconded it, right? You did before. Okay, so I have to second that, so I do. Okay. 
for the development of the Teacher because with the interviews, I'm, I'm not really ready to put this forward. And I think I have to do it. So do you want to Certainly. amend your motion again, Linda? I would like to. Uh, <laughs> Let's make it do it three or four times. Sorry. How about five? Is Gary here for the Ed Tech twos? <laughs> so we we okay. Hey, I'm going to amend my motion. I'd like to put forth two job descriptions tonight. One for the school nutritional director, uh, taking off the first two paragraphs of the school nutritional director's uh, job description. Also for an Ed Tech two integrator for the teacher's position as presented. Thank you, Linda. Rebecca, are you still willing to second that? Oh, sure. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments, including from the peanut gallery? <laughs> um, in all seriousness, does any other board member have a question or a comment on these two job descriptions? I would like to just comment, thank Alan, Karen, and Pauline for all their work on the uh, school nutritional director. Obviously, they did a lot of research and analysis to put this, um, this document together. So mm -hmm. all kidding aside, they really did a wonderful job. All those in favor of the motion on the table? Seven, nothing. Thank you, Linda, and the Human Resources Committee, and those who did help. Um, committee reports, I'd just like to make a quick reminder that the minutes for all the committee meetings are on the um, website, so I would ask each committee chair to um, highlight only what you feel is pertinent. Linda, I think you, is, you. okay, Linda. Um, actually, I'd like to uh, update the board. The extracurricular ad hoc committee, newly formed this year, actually had uh, their first meeting. I'd like to, first of all, thank Janet, uh, Jeff Thorak, Jeff Shedd, Scott Labby, um, Steve Conley, all of those involved. Um, they've done a lot of work on several different projects around extracurricular and co-curricular activities, brought to the ad hoc committee a couple of recommendations. Um, number one, some revisions to the middle school athletics program, um, hopefully to for the parents to see some actual cost savings in the way the program is run next year. To, uh, the committee has brought to us a recommendation that they're going to put forth a one-time administrative fee plus a lower cost per sport fee for the students involved, as well as a refundable uniform fee. And Janet, please correct me oh. if I'm misnaming any of these. Um, the uniform fee is either refundable or you can roll it over from season to season so that you don't have to keep paying a different fee for every sport. You pay one fee for the uniform and as long as you turn in the uniform, you get credit for that to apply to another sport or the fee is refunded. Um, looking at the program over the past year, how it's operated, we're actually seeing that it has the potential of saving most families money. Um, to participate in either one or two sports. Um, that was one of the things that the committee wanted to bring to us. Um, the other thing had to do with issues uh, in and around Hannaford Field. Uh, Janet, again, I'd like to thank her for all of her coordinated efforts to update some of the guidelines on the use of the field and some of the guidelines that we have as part of our, that go along with some of our policies as well. As far as firming up some game times for JV and varsity sports, um, to work more closely with the scheduling of all of these sports through the athletic department. Um, updates on these will be available on the website as, as they're completed. And if I can sure. ask a question about sure. the turf field guidelines. Is somebody, either the council or the board, going to look at that? Because I believe that there's a pretty substantial change to the hours of operation into the night for two nights a week. For Friday and Saturday night was mainly to accommodate. And actually, I might have Jeff or Janet, either one of them, speak yeah, to that. I don't, be I, quite a lot of conversation. Is well, I actually don't, un unless it's more of a procedural question yeah. as to who is, is, there going, is, is there a required process by which that gets approved by somebody? Because we are going to be extending the hours by, and I know that there was a length, there was a pretty involved process about asking neighbors about 
the time of operation of the turf field, and now it's being changed. Don't we want to have that go through some sort of public discussion? Well, I do know that there were conversations, and Alan, you might want to, you know, speak speak uh, on this as well. But I do know that there were conversations between Jeff um, with the police chief. Yeah, but if the public doesn't know this, I, I think your I think what I'm hearing your question is, is your background. It's probably a question we do need to think about: is when we made the initial plans when the turf field was first opened what the agreement was that the first year would be kind of the experimental year to see where we were, what we were doing, et cetera. And so this is the second year, and we have come back to take a look at uh, def definition, I believe, of night games, when they happen, et cetera, and how late it goes. Uh, because the turf field committee has been disbanded and was disbanded as of December 31st, uh, the question is, do we need to uh, get either board approval or town council approval, or do we need to do it from the perspective of uh, clear, concise advertising to the public? It isn't a question we discussed to any great extent, and so we may need to relook at that piece and see where we are with that. Um, I really hadn't thought of that before. I, lo I was only looking at it when we were in meetings and discussing it both in the extracur extra extracurricular meeting and then in the extracurricular meeting as uh, solidifying what had been done in the past. And so I'm not sure uh, whether we, we need to do it from either a acceptable, accepting standpoint from the board or a good uh, advertising process to make sure the public knows. I don't remember also, and I, I just need to get clarification, uh, does this change take us later into the evening with games, yes. football for instance? It allows for the time that they have extended to already. Anyway, yeah. so essentially, what it does is it changes um, the facility hours of operation from Sunday through Thursday, from 8 a.m. to 8:30. So the change would be originally Monday through Friday, 8 a.m. to 8:30 p.m. What we're recommending is Sunday through Thursday, and then Friday and Saturday. 8.30 to 9.30, so extending it one hour to accommodate um, a 7 p.m. football game. And generally, most of our competitions take place. So the reason I brought this up is because I want to make sure that we're following through with what we're doing. And our games will start at, a junior varsity game will start at approximately 4 o'clock. Um, followed by a varsity game, which is around 5.45 or 6 o'clock. And the reason I brought this to the attention was because in the original facilities policy, I believe it said night games will be considered a game that starts at 5.45. And there were a limited number of night games that a team could participate in. I, 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 off the top of my head, I can't remember. I think it might have been 14 each season, so fall and spring. I believe that 14 rings a bell. Um, so that kind of brought me to think a little bit about what we're really doing and making sure that we're following through on that. So th those are the reasons why I made that suggestion. And then Friday night es essentially helps cover um, really about the half an hour that we're over on our um, game time. Generally that football game will start at 7. Um, and approximately 9, 9.15 allows a little time to help clean up trash around 9.30. Is that any different than what's been happening this year? Or are you just making the policy reflect what's, what happened this year? Exactly. Trying to have the policy reflect what we're actually doing. So the policy, this recommendation is reflecting practice. Correct. And so you're not changing the number of game nights. Those were... Those are all recommended in the public, so you're really reflecting what's happening. Exactly. exactly. So and it's technically not a change, it's just in activity, which to Rebecca's point would we're not, make us not as good a neighbor, right. per yeah. se. No, I'm not I'm not, we're not adding or subtract. I mean, everything's staying the same as far as the, the countable competitions, everything like that. But I just felt really um, the games 
essentially begin at, at 6 o'clock. Um, junior varsity game will end. Um, if it starts at 4, 4.15, that's going to end around 5.30. Um, generally, there's about a half an hour warm-up in between games. So the 6 o'clock start time is really when we're starting these contests. And as I mentioned in the past, the 5.45 is what was in the, in the uh, Hanford Field policy. And that 5.45 is what um, dictated what was considered a night game. But we do have a policy, so this does change the policy, right? And this is a guideline. It's, it's KF. A guideline. It's, it's a regulation, right. correct. And it's sort of tied in with community services, right? Um, as far as the timing of and the start of the night facility. game is KFR, the use of facilities is community services. My, my only point is when, when people in the community were approached about the turf field and the lights, they were given specific information about the hours of operation. Whether the actual experiences this year met what they were told or not, I cannot, dis I'm not going to get into the dispute. All I'm trying to say is, is if we are saying what is going to be happening in the future does not match up with what was discussed with the public and the community, I think we have a responsibility to re-engage them and get them um, to, to agree. If it is exactly the same as what was discussed with them originally, then we ha I don't see there it is an issue. But I think it's only fair to the neighbors of this facility that if we are changing the hours of the operation of this field from what they were told when they agreed, that we should go back and, and discuss this with them. Is that something that can be done without holding up scheduling for next year? I mean, technically, we're not approving anything. Can we ask that that be done? I, I, I think the question is, uh, you know, listening closely to what Rebecca said, and I understand where she's coming from, is I guess the question is what, we, what the time changes reflect is what was actually happening. So is the best way to do this for public information to go to the newspaper and have just do a review of the use of the turf field and how it's happening in the times, et cetera, to make that very clear to the public. Because I understand where Rebecca's coming from. I know that was a major issue uh, when we first started. Uh, so that's one step that could go. If there is a need for the board to take a look at the whole thing and vote on it, uh, I, I, that will be held up until fall, and we do need to get schedules rolling. So I, I, I guess my question would be for the board, would a, a good step at this point to get it publicly out in newspaper article or somehow that we, what we are doing and how it is reflected in the, in the plan? I think we can ask to do that. If it's a guideline, we don't need to vote on it. So uh, if the board's comfortable with Alan and Janet and Jeff, per se, sort of following up on that, I think, is, that, is the board comfortable with that? a guideline it's not the board's responsibility mm -hmm. to vote on right. it so I would say that it's an administrator's mm -hmm. responsibility as our other guidelines yep so whether I doesn't matter whether I you know what I mean I think that the board's a little yep. bit out of that but how you decide you want to communicate that with the public I think is always a good idea to especially because it affects neighbors mm -hmm. Does that, yeah, does that, everyone agree? Okay, any other committee reports? Thank you, extracurricular committee. Any other committee reports? I'll just briefly say that I did send out minutes from the Alternative Energy Committee. Um, I emailed them, and I also me emailed, and hopefully they can make it on the web. <laughs> I also emailed um, a copy of the email that went to Mike McGovern and then came to the Alternative Energy Committee. Um, from Jim Cohen at Verrill Dana about um, weatherization and so forth, um, possible stimulus fund funding package information. So when you have a chance, you might take a look at that and if there's any questions or whatever. Um, we have another Alternative Energy Committee meeting Monday, the 15th at 6.30 in the Technology Conference Room. So if you have any 
questions, thoughts, whatever, let me know and I'll bring them to the meeting. Thank you, Kathy. Anybody else? Um, I need to report on a couple of things that's happening up in Augusta. Um, around the budget. <clears throat> in particular, it seems that the current forecast for funding in fiscal year 2011, um, education is going, to be is going to be hit particularly hard. And they are forecasting that the state's share of funding will go decrease to only 45.5% of the total EPS allocation, and that is lower than the 55% target level that we have never achieved in the state of Maine. And the other issue is that over the summer, I believe that the Appropriations Committee is going to be meeting to discuss the idea proposed by the governor to put a portion, if any, of the employer share of teacher retirement costs into the EPS funding, which essentially would transfer the cost of retirement from the state level to the local level. And that is a particular concern to Cape Elizabeth because we are such a low receiver of state funding that we as a district could end up funding nearly 80 plus percent of our teachers' retirement. Probably every 88. Year. And I'm sorry, Pauline, I don't remember what that translated to in millions of dollars. I know you gave that to us. One point. One, that would be an addition of $1.8 million to our annual school budget. So um, Every you, year? Uh, per year. Mm -hmm. So um, needless to say, um, we shall be watching that very carefully. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Rebecca. Anyone else? Okay, public comment on agenda items. I don't think there's anyone from the public. Um, school board agenda requests. Um, announcements of upcoming meeting. The next school board meeting is August 25th from 3.30 to 6.30. Um, I think the school board would like to wish all of our staff and students a great summer. And can I have a motion to adjourn to executive session? I move that we enter into executive session pursuant to one MRSA 4056D and 4056A for the purpose of discussing negotiations. Thank you, Kathy Mira. Did you second. want to second that? Um, thank you. All those in favor? Thank you. Um, seven.